Deborah Kaur was a patrolwoman with the Aurora Police Department in Colorado. The 26-year-old had been with the department for a year. On June 27, 1981, Officer Kaur pulled over a vehicle, hit East Colfax Avenue and Moline Street, after witnessing its driver commit a traffic violation. 19-year-old Glenn Spies pulled up behind her patrol car after she began her interaction with the driver. Glenn was driving home from his shift for Aurora's Police Explorers program. The program allowed young people to gain some experience in law enforcement in order to help them discern if they wanted to pursue a career in it. At the beginning of each shift, Glenn would go to the police station to pick up a police radio and perform simple patrol tasks like checking for graffiti and watching out for trouble at local parks and pools. As Glenn got out of his vehicle, Officer Kaur was placing the driver, who was struggling to get away from her, under arrest. She had a handcuff on one of his wrists when he was able to gain control of her service weapon. Glenn heard Officer Kaur scream for help before the driver shot her with her own gun. Upon hearing the shot, Glenn tried to hide behind the patrol car, but the assailant was able to shoot him as well. The bullet shattered near his spine. The shooter took off in his vehicle. Glenn could not move as a result of the location of his injury, and he was unable to go for help or get to Officer Kaur. Glenn was rushed to the hospital. Despite initial concerns, he did not lose his ability to walk. His injury did prevent him from continuing into law enforcement, however, as it left him in a great deal of pain and made walking difficult. Officer Kaur did not survive her injuries. That day, she became the first Aurora police officer to be killed in the line of duty. Her killer was quickly identified as 30-year-old Joe Michael Irvin. Irvin was originally from North Texas. He had come to Colorado in 1969 to escape prosecution for another murder. In October of that year, a grand jury in Tarrant County indicted him for a murder which had occurred at a bowling alley in Fort Worth two months earlier. The victim in that crime was 21-year-old Rodney Jean Bonham. During his time in Colorado, Irvin was suspected in several rapes and murders and was arrested but allowed out on bond in connection to two different cases. He was never connected back to the indictment in Texas because his year of birth had been incorrectly entered into the system when the arrest warrant was issued and he had been living under the surname of Irving while in Colorado. Because these issues had not yet been uncovered, he was never extradited to Texas. When Irvin was arrested at his residence for Officer Kaur's murder, he was in the process of attempting to saw her handcuff off of his wrist. Unfortunately, Irvin was never brought to justice for Officer Kaur's murder. On July 1, 1981, just a few days after his arrest, while he was being held in the Adams County Detention Center, he took his own life. More than four decades later, authorities would learn that Officer Kaur had not been Irvin's first victim in Colorado. She had been his last. On January 28, 2022, authorities announced that they were closing four cold cases they were now attributing to Irvin. DNA had tied him to the four murders, three in Denver and one in Adams County, Colorado, that occurred between December of 1978 and January of 1981. While exact details have not been made public, Denver Police Commander Matt Clark did disclose that all of the cases had an underlying sexual component. 33-year-old Madeline Fury Lividay was killed on December 7, 1978. She was stabbed to death inside of her home on Poplar Street in Denver. Investigators believe Irvin came to her door and forced his way inside to kill her when she opened it. Madeline was the mother of two young daughters. According to her sisters, Madeline was creative and adventurous. She loved learning and traveling, but nothing as much as she loved her two girls. She was an ecologist, writer, and editor for the children's magazine Ranger Rick. Tragically, we didn't get to grow up with her and hear the stories and witness the contributions she would have made to the world. Madeline's daughter Molly said after her mother's killer was finally identified. The body of Irvin's next victim, 53-year-old Dolores Barajas was discovered on August 10, 1980, lying in the street in the 500 block of East 17th Avenue in Denver. 
she had been stabbed to death while walking to work at the Fairmont Hotel in downtown Denver, where she was employed in the cafeteria. Dolores had been working in Denver temporarily while spending the summer with relatives in Colorado and was about to return home to her family in El Paso, Texas. The day of her murder was her last day of work at the hotel before she traveled back to Texas. Dolores' family said in a statement read at the announcement of Irvin's identification that they still miss her greatly and they are grateful for all of the efforts that ultimately resulted in her case being solved. They have requested that police not release any photos of her. The body of Gwendolyn Harris, 27, was found lying in the street near East 47th Avenue and Andrews Drive in Denver's Montbello neighborhood on December 21, 1980. She had been stabbed to death. The night before, she had been seen at the Polo Club Lounge in downtown Denver, somewhere she was known to frequent. The location where her body was found was more than 10 miles away from where she was last seen, and within one block of Irvin's home at the time. According to her family, Gwendolyn was bright, soft-spoken, and athletic. Irvin's youngest victim was 17-year-old Antoinette Tony Parks. Sheriff's deputies in Adams County found her body in a field near 64th Avenue and Broadway on January 24, 1981. She had been stabbed 23 times. At the time of her murder, Tony was six to seven months pregnant. She was a good student at Gateway High School and was determined to finish her high school education after she gave birth. She loved children, and the children in her family loved spending time with her. Her family believes she would have one day owned and operated her own daycare center. The four cases were originally investigated separately However, between 2013 and 2018, they were all connected as a result of DNA evidence from the crime scenes. Dolores and Madeline's cases were linked thanks to DNA in June of 2013, and DNA found during an examination of the evidence in Gwendolyn's case linked her murder to those two cases in December of 2015. DNA then tied Tony's murder in Adams County to the three Denver murders in October of 2018. In 2019, the investigative team began an in-house effort to use genetic genealogy to identify the individual whose DNA was found at the four crime scenes. This eventually narrowed their focus to the state of Texas, where the killer appeared to have extended family. Investigators in Colorado worked with their counterparts in Texas to perform familial searches in the Texas criminal database. This led to the identification of a more direct relative of the killer in 2021. By looking at this individual's family tree, authorities then identified Joe Michael Irvin as a potential suspect who required further investigation. No archived samples of Irvin's DNA could be located Following his death in Colorado in 1981, Irvin's body was returned to his home state, and he was buried in Arlington, Texas. In late 2021, his remains were exhumed so that a DNA sample could be collected from them. In January of 2022, a direct comparison confirmed that it was Irvin's DNA found at all four crime scenes. Irvin's identification was highly emotional for the families of his victims. By the time Irvin was identified, Tony Parks' mother and three sisters had all passed away without ever learning the identity of Tony's killer. Only Tony's two brothers, George and Carl Journey, lived long enough to learn who had taken Tony from them. George told Denver 7 News that he spent three hours crying after learning his sister's case was finally closed. He still loves and misses his sister, and while he is grateful for answers and all of the hard work, that went into finding them, he still struggles with Tony's death. In addition, he also struggles with the fact that Irvin cannot be prosecuted for Tony's murder. I'm angered because he didn't face justice, he told KCNC TV, but I know my mom and family wouldn't want us angry. They'd want us to be happy that this is all brought to a close. His brother Carl lives in Arkansas, and the family was concerned about finding the funds to fly him back to Colorado so that he and George could process the news together. 
Denver 7 News was able to provide the money for the flight through community donations to their Denver 7 Gives program, allowing both George and Carl to attend and speak at the press conference announcing Irvin's identification. Madeline Fury Livides, two daughters, Molly and Ariel, were also at the press conference, where Molly read a statement. In addition to recalling their mother's memory and accomplishments, they also thanked the investigators who had finally identified her killer. They also recognized Officer Deborah Corr and the lives she saved with her death. With her sacrifice, she prevented him from killing anyone else, and it's clear that he wasn't going to stop on his own. She stopped him. The police stopped him back in 1981. And for that, for Officer Corr's sacrifice of her life, we are grateful, Molly said in her statement. While Irvin cannot be prosecuted for the murders, authorities believe the years of effort that ultimately led to his identification were still beneficial. While the perpetrator cannot be fully held accountable for his despicable actions, we hope that knowing who is responsible can bring some peace to the families, Denver Police Chief Paul Pazin said at the press conference. In November of 2021, both the Harrisonburg Police Department and the Charlottesville Police Department were conducting missing persons investigations in Virginia. Police in Charlottesville were looking for Tonita Nita Smith, a 39-year-old mother of six young children. She was last seen on the evening of November 14th in Charlottesville and reported missing on November 19th. Police in Charlottesville had reason to believe that she had traveled to Harrisonburg, Virginia, a city more than 50 miles away in Rockingham County. Police there were looking for 54-year-old Aline Elizabeth Beth Redman at the same time. Beth was the mother of two daughters and a grandmother of four. Her husband had passed away in 2017, leaving her heartbroken. Four years later, she was just beginning to get her life back together. She had just gotten a new job and a new apartment, so that she would not be surrounded by memories of her late husband. Beth had not been seen since October 24th. Her family could not contact her, and she did not come home to her apartment. She also failed to report to work, which was highly unusual for her. She did not have access to a vehicle, limiting her ability to travel on her own. The last time her family talked to her, she told them she was going to the Howard Johnson Hotel on Linda Lane to watch a football game with someone named Ant. No one in her family had heard her talk about someone with that name before. The unrelated investigations into Nita and Beth's disappearances came together in Harrisonburg on November 23, 2021, when the bodies of both women were found near each other in an undeveloped lot in a commercial area off of Linda Lane. The two women had both been murdered, but at different times. I knew that I had to lose my mom one day, but never did I ever imagine that I would be in a way like this. It's the most hurtful thing that anybody could ever, ever experience, Beth's daughter Jessica said after her mother's body was located. The discovery of Nita's body came at an already difficult time of year for her family. Her body was located three days after the ninth anniversary of the disappearance of her niece, 19-year-old Sage Smith. While Sage's case was initially investigated as a missing persons case, it was reclassified as a homicide investigation in November of 2016. Her case remains unsolved. The same day the two bodies were found, 35-year-old Anthony Robinson was arrested for the two women's murders. He was charged with two counts of first-degree murder as well as two felony counts of concealing, transporting, or altering a dead body. Robinson was tied to the two victims using cell phone records and surveillance footage. He had met both of them on dating sites. Police believe they were both killed at the motel where Robinson was staying. Video surveillance shows him pushing a shopping cart from his room. Police allege that the shopping cart was used to transport his victims' bodies. This method of transporting the bodies would lead to authorities referring to Robinson as the shopping cart killer at a press conference on December 17th, at which they announced they believed Robinson was a serial killer. Shortly after Nita and Beth's bodies were found, police in Washington, D.C. contacted the Harrisonburg Police Department. 
they were in the middle of their own missing persons investigation, and Robinson was the last known person to be in contact with the person they were looking for. 29-year-old Cheyenne Brown lived in Washington, D.C. She was a kind soul who was nice, potentially too nice, to everyone she met. She was the loving mother of a seven-year-old son. She was last seen on September 30th, 2021, when she was approximately four months pregnant. That day, she was last seen by her family getting on to a local bus. She then took the metro from D.C. to the Huntington Station in Fairfax County, Virginia. Surveillance footage shows her with Robinson at the metro station in D.C. Cell phone records show that after taking the metro, Cheyenne was in the 6100 block of nearby Richmond Highway, the Moon Inn Hotel, where staff has confirmed Robinson was staying at the time, is located in that block. Authorities in Fairfax County had searched the area around the hotel previously, but had not found any sign of Cheyenne. When they returned to the scene after speaking with authorities about the two victims found in Harrisonburg to conduct a larger search, however, a homicide detective noticed a shopping cart in a vacant lot in the vicinity of the hotel. Knowing that Robinson had allegedly used a shopping cart to transport the bodies of the two women found in Harrisonburg, the search was focused onto that area. Not far from the shopping cart, authorities found a large plastic container containing two sets of human remains. Cheyenne Brown's family positively identified a distinctive tattoo she had on one of the sets of remains, leading authorities to tentatively identify those remains as Cheyenne. My heart is broken. Just the thought of my baby not being here is devastating. It's like a bad dream I just want to wake up from. Cheyenne's mother, Nicondra Brown, who had called local hospitals and morgues as part of her desperate search for her daughter before her remains were located, told the Washington Post. Cheyenne's family believes that Robinson may have been in contact with her prior to her disappearance. According to Cheyenne's cousin, Jonathan Willis, he went to Nicondra Brown's home in mid to late September while Nicondra was out of the country for work. Cheyenne was there with a man he did not know. He asked the man to leave the home, since Nicondra did not like people she had not met being inside her home when she was not there. The man, who Jonathan believes could be Robinson, left without incident. The state of decomposition the other set of remains was found in complicated identifying them, although investigators identified a missing woman from Redding, California, Stephanie Harrison as a potential match to the remains. 48-year-old Stephanie was last in contact with her family on August 19th, while she was on a sightseeing trip in Washington, D.C. Stephanie had three children and three grandchildren. She normally called her children multiple times throughout the day, so her daughter Destiny knew something was wrong when the routine calls from her mother stopped. My mom was super family-oriented. She was a beautiful, kind soul. She put everyone before herself. She would drop anything she was doing if you called and needed her help. She would give you her last dime if you needed it, Destiny said of her mother. The last transaction on Stephanie's bank records occurred at the Moon Inn Hotel when she checked into a room there. She told her family she knew people in the Washington, D.C. area and may have been communicating with people online. Authorities from Virginia traveled to California to collect DNA samples from Jessica's family members to compare to the remains. On January 7, 2022, authorities announced that DNA had confirmed that the remains found near the hotel belonged to Cheyenne Brown and Stephanie Harrison. Robinson has no known criminal record, although he has interacted with the police in Washington, D.C. before. On three occasions, in 2012 and 2013, Robinson was involved when police were called for a domestic dispute, unauthorized use of a vehicle, and an argument Robinson had with his aunt. He was not accused of violence during any of these incidents, and they did not result in an arrest or any charges. Police believe Robinson met his victims through various social media and online dating sites, although the only ones they have publicly discussed by name are tagged and plenty of fish. Since his arrest, at least two women who met him through such sites have come forward to police. They say that when they met Robinson in person, they could tell that something was wrong, 
and quickly ended their dates with him, which police believe may have saved their lives. Authorities would like to speak with any other women who met Robinson online, particularly through dating sites. Robinson lived a transient lifestyle, moving around and working various jobs. In addition to Virginia and Washington, D.C., he has known former addresses in Maryland and New York. Authorities are investigating possible ties between Robinson and other unsolved cases in various locations. He didn't suddenly turn into who he is three months ago. That's why we are painstakingly going through his whereabouts, his relationships, and employment history to figure out if, in fact, there are other victims. The good thing is he's in custody. The challenge that remains is identifying other victims. Fairfax County Police Chief Kevin Davis said after Robinson's arrest. So far, only one other potential victim has been identified. Investigators are currently working to determine if Robinson is connected to the murder of a young woman whose body was found in a shopping cart in Washington, D.C. on September 7, 2021. Her name has not been made public. Digital evidence allegedly places Robinson in the area at the time the victim went missing. While authorities believe it is important to publicize the details of Robinson's crimes in order to identify other potential victims in other parts of the country, Robinson's lawyer disagrees. In a court filing made in December of 2021, his lawyer asked the court to issue a gag order that would prevent law enforcement from using the term shopping cart killer, releasing information in the case to the public without the permission of the court or referring to Robinson as a serial killer. He argues that language used by various departments involved in the case is prejudicial and will impact his client's ability to receive a fair trial. He further argues that it is inaccurate to refer to his client as a serial killer, as he has so far only formally been charged with two murders. The Fairfax County Police Department issued a statement in response to the filing standing by their handling of the investigation. The court proceedings are ongoing. Sixty-two-year-old Gladys May Hensley lived in an apartment within a senior living complex on High Street in Eugene, Oregon. On June 5, 1986, the staff at the complex became concerned because they had not seen Gladys in a few days and decided to perform a welfare check. When they entered the apartment, they discovered Gladys's body. She had been murdered. The police estimated her time of death as the early morning hours of the previous day, June 4th. One of the apartment's windows was found unlocked and all of the curtains had been drawn. Two weeks later, there was another murder in Eugene. While there were differences in victim profile and the location where each victim was found, the Eugene Police Department believed the two cases were connected due to the fact that the crime scenes were only a few miles away from each other and the manner of death of each of the victims was the same. That manner of death has not been specified publicly and only described by police as the result of homicidal violence. The second victim was 33-year-old Janice Dickinson. On June 19, 1986, her nude and bloody body was discovered lying face up under a tree along a hillside behind a car dealership on Colberg Road. She had been sexually assaulted, and there were signs of a struggle at the scene. These two murders would later be connected to a case being investigated by the Oregon State Police. 73-year-old Geraldine Spencer Tuhi lived alone in her home on Franklin Boulevard in Eugene. On the evening of February 27, 1988, she was speaking on the phone with her sister. The call suddenly cut off in the middle of the conversation. Geraldine's sister went to the home the following morning to pick Geraldine up for church. When she looked inside the house through a window, she saw her sister's half-naked body on the floor inside. Geraldine had been sexually assaulted. Her phone line had been cut, explaining the abrupt end to the call with her sister the night before. Police believed that her killer had known she lived alone and had forced their way in through the front door. A sketch of a potential suspect was developed, but did not lead to an arrest. There was little progress in the investigations in the following years, despite the efforts of the authorities and public appeals from the victims' families. In 2000, 
Examination of DNA evidence confirmed that all three murders had been committed by the same individual. There was no match found to this profile in criminal databases. In 2016, Virginia-based Parabon Nanolabs began offering the Snapshot Phenotyping Service, which predicts physical features and generates images of what the contributor of a provided DNA sample might look like. Police in Oregon paid for the service in connection to the three women's murders, and two images, showing what their suspect may have looked like at age 25 and at age 55, were generated. Investigators received the images in September of 2017 and released them to the public in January of 2018, with an appeal for anyone who knew someone who resembled the man pictured in the report to come forward. Unfortunately, despite over 100 tips being called in, the appeal did not lead to an identification. Investigators then worked again with Parabon Nanolabs to use genetic genealogy in the case. The effort identified four potential suspects for them to follow up on. After extensive further investigation, on February 2, 2022, the Eugene Police Department announced that Gladys, Janice, and Geraldine's killer had been identified as John Charles Bolsinger. In addition to the DNA evidence, fingerprint evidence, footwear analysis, and the development of a timeline of Bolsinger's movements at the time of the murders all supported his identification. Unfortunately, Bolsinger could not be prosecuted for the murders because he committed suicide in Springfield, Oregon on March 23, 1988, less than a month after Geraldine Toohey's murder. Bolsinger was convicted of second-degree murder in Utah for the March 29, 1980 murder of 33-year-old Casey Sorensen, who died, according to Bolsinger's confession, during consensual sexual asphyxiation. He served five years in prison and was paroled to Springfield, Oregon on March 7, 1986. Gladys was killed in neighboring Eugene, Oregon, just under three months later, and Janice was murdered just two weeks after that. On September 26, 1986, Bolsinger was arrested after breaking into a woman's home. That night, the woman was having trouble sleeping, and she heard her dog making strange noises in her kitchen. When she got up to investigate, she found a man reaching in through her kitchen window to remove a brace preventing her sliding glass door from being opened. She ran into her living room and called 911. The man made entry into the house and followed her into the living room. When he tried to take the phone from her, she began screaming and hitting him with the phone as well as a nearby flashlight. The man fled the residence, leaving behind a down vest and a paring knife. The woman told the police that the man had run off when they arrived just after he escaped, and he was soon apprehended by a canine officer. The intruder was Bolsinger. He said he had gone up to the woman's house and knocked on the door a few times, but nothing else, and claimed that he remembered nothing else about the home, as he was suffering from memory loss. Bolsinger was sentenced to five years in prison, but was only in custody in Oregon for less than one year. He was transferred from the Oregon Department of Corrections to the Utah State Prison on August 4, 1987, to serve time for violating his parole. He was released from prison in Utah just a few months later, on December 7. He returned to Oregon and enrolled at Lane Community College for the winter 1988 term. Geraldine was murdered in February of 1988. Bolsinger took his own life in March just a few weeks after the release of the sketch of the suspect in her case, although there is no way of knowing if the sketch influenced his decision. Authorities have not been able to identify any sort of relationship between Bolsinger and any of his three victims in Oregon. The press release announcing Bolsinger's identification concluded by saying, the Eugene Police Department and the Oregon State Police are pleased to finally bring closure to the family members of Gladys, Janice, and Geraldine, as well as our community. Both agencies remain committed to constantly evaluating unsolved cases and utilizing emerging technologies to bring closure to other families of crime victims. This resolution would not have been possible without the dedication of numerous police officers, detectives, crime scene investigators, and crime lab analysts over the last 35 years.